Welcome back everyone. Thanks for joining me once again on this reverse recruitment 0% growths LTC. Today, we embark on a nighttime raid. Three dash one is the second consecutive map with a predetermined deployment formation. The objective is to rout the enemy army within 12 turns, which is almost insulting at this point. This is complicated somewhat by Fog of War, but there are three lit torches on the map providing us vision. Between that and the fact that we know where all the enemies are, the fog isn't a huge deal. Khalil one rounds most enemies on the map, but you can't be everywhere at once. It just so happens that the left side of the map has a high concentration of enemies and is not far from our starting position. Sending Khalil there will minimize her weak mobility and maximize her ability to do combat. Mordecai transforms near the mosh pit of generals. Their weapons will all bounce off of his hide. Meanwhile, Ike spearheads the middle offensive. This section of the map will be the most complicated to deal with, because it's the one where our enemy phase will be the least efficient. Ike needs to reach some specific tiles in future turns, but attacking that halberdier required not using his full movement. Danved is able to put Ike back on pace with a shove. After that, we set up a formation to lure in the Thunder Sage visible in the top right. Ike could have been the bait here if he had been shoved before moving, but we don't want to risk losing HP on him. We need him to start the next turn in good health. Har the Dragon Master is a so-called partner unit on this map, but he'll join us soon enough. His inventory is empty because Lyre, the unit he replaces, has no items in vanilla. Inventories can be replaced, but not expanded. This kind of thing will happen a few more times later in the run, as Bayork units replace Lagoos. This 22 speed Swordmaster has a killing edge. He chooses to attack Makalov because he gets doubled, but as long as the Paladin doesn't get crit twice, he lives. This sniper with a longbow chooses to attack Leith instead of Heather for reasons I don't understand. Heather has half of Leith's defense, and there aren't any special skills in play. That said, we can use this odd targeting priority to lure that sniper to a specific spot. Since he can attack from three scores away, we must defeat him on player phase. Circling back to Makalov, some quick math tells me he would probably die to a single crit and a second attack if his stats were decreased as intended. That would be a significant drop in reliability, and I'm not sure that there's a workaround. At least that combat happens on turn 1, so it's not too painful if you have to reset. Khalil will easily defeat the Longbow Sniper. We attack with Elwind where possible, because Elfire is stronger, and we only get one of those until next chapter. We want to make sure we have enough Elfire for busy enemy phases like this next one. Heather can help Khalil re-equip the stronger tome, and then use the smite skill we've given her to push the mage two spaces to the left. As if the middle section weren't complex enough already, some of the enemy stats here can vary by a point or two. Here I discover that this warrior rolled high on defense, which was something I hadn't seen before. I had a few variations on this strategy planned out, but this wasn't one of them. In the end, Danved has to make a less than ideal attack. With that handled, here in Kanto's into range of a halberdier we cannot see. Killing the warrior also opens up a lane for Leith to take out this Thunder Sage. Makalov is next. Here he can finish two hit KOing the Swordmaster, but with intended stats, he would need Danved's help. This would require the warrior with a hammer to roll his usual 14 defense, rather than 15. Makalov cantoed up one space so that Lucia could take the steel blade and use it on this axe general, who also rolled high on defense. It costs us yet more liability, but it's within our ability to handle. Joffrey will canto back afterward, in a movement that doesn't have to be too precise. He just has to stay out of range of the enemies north of that wall. Finally, Ike uses Heather's past skill to sneak behind the ranged halberdier and get within range of several enemies. 
The X General is stationary, so this is a vital means of getting damage on him. Ike will also lure out a Sniper and a Thunder Sage. He will face a small but notable chance of death on this turn. Meanwhile, Mordecai is showing off his moves in the middle of the mosh pit. It's worth taking some time now to talk about the Biorhythm mechanic, which is unique to Radiant Dawn and its predecessor, Path of Radiance. In combat, a unit's Biorhythm affects hit rate, avoid rate, and skill activation rate. Good and best Biorhythm increase these chances by 5 and 10% respectively, while bad and worst do the opposite. These correspond to the green or red arrows in the unit window that point up or down. Different units progress through their Biorhythm curves at different rates and to different extremes, but they always start at neutral on the turn that they join, and begin curving upward. At the start of each enemy phase, Biorhythm proceeds to the next stage. This makes the mechanic entirely deterministic, for player units at least. Khalil reached best Biorhythm on this enemy phase, so between that, the 10 avoid from the thicket, and her natural evasion, she has been nearly impossible to hit. At this point, nearly every remaining enemy is visible to us. The most difficult one to take down is the boss, Ramit, so Joffrey applies some crucial chip damage. After he can't us out of range, Halil will follow up and bring him to low enough HP that a second Elfire will kill. Those open door houses aren't just for show. They each contain an item that we want. Heather visits the top house. It's important that we not do this with Astrid, Karen, or Joffrey, otherwise we get nothing. The bottom house is safe to visit with anyone. Mordecai has one point of his Lagoo's gauge remaining, and we're going to use it. Halil and Mordecai have basically completed their jobs at this point. Now it's time for the cleanup crew. After a safety save, Lucia moves forward to eliminate the Thunder Sage who could have killed Ike with a 4% crit. Using pass once again, Ike moves within range of the final enemy. He could be as low as one hit point by now, so he chugs a healing item. This coward of a halberdier is stationary, and he's no stronger than the other ones Ike has defeated. Even with intended stats, Makalov would have enough attack power to finish off this weakened axe general. The key is to make sure Lucia is in a position such that Makalov can reclaim the steel blade and attack with it. The final sniper will fall to the combined efforts of Leith and Kieran. After that, we're all set for the final enemy phase. There are two things that could still go wrong here. Ike could miss an attack, or the boss could hit and crit Khalil. With both of those outcomes avoided, the remaining two enemies are a victory lap. In spite of the many challenges, we clear 3-1 in 3 turns. I'll confess I'm rather proud of that one. Join me next time for some completely normal commentary. It'll be great. Take care everyone. Oh.